somebody in uh, medical school would come up with something and uh, would walk over to the business school, find somebody eventually who had a student who was interested in taking up the project. Uh, so that's the way it was happening. Uh -huh. So seven startups a year, but completely by chance. So that was my analysis uh -huh. that I gave to the research. And Artie said, OTL, they're not even my radar. Uh -huh. Doing great, make more money each year. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Okay, I get the same analysis to OTL. Okay, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, Artie invited me to stay on, but uh, I didn't see the point. So I, I uh, was invited to take a chair in the UK uh, at Newcastle University uh -huh. Uh -huh. and set up a research group there. Uh -huh. In the in, same area, entrepreneurship? Yes, yes. Yeah. Although they didn't call me that. Entrepreneurship was looked down upon at that yeah, time. That's right. So I was a professor <laughs> of innovation, creativity, and enterprise. Oh. Now all my friends in the UK yeah. are professors of entrepreneurship. All the sociologists, economists, everybody. Okay, uh, so but then uh, so we did some interesting things there. That I've written about uh, professors of practice uh, bringing in the high-level people into the university on a half-time basis, keeping their connections in companies, and they all did great projects, thinking on a large scale. Because that was my analysis of the states. People didn't leave the university when they did this. So they came back mm -hmm. and thought on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. If they had done a center, they would do a center of centers. Uh -huh. Okay, and that happened uh -huh. there in Newcastle. But they couldn't scale it up. Uh -huh. Culture was against it, and leadership changed. The, the country culture or the university culture? Both. University culture. Uh -huh. Well, both in a yeah. way, but and that's changing, but slowly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, I saw the writing on the wall. And then I was invited to come back to Stanford uh, to the uh, Clayman Institute of Gender Research. I had another line of research on women in science and technology. Hmm. I came back, continued on my work in that area, and then I decided to stay <laughs> and hooked up with different parts of Stanford. Uh, that, that was the Vortex University you uh, talk yeah, about, right, probably. Right, yeah, right, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, the H Star Institute, uh, and uh, then uh, the uh, Science Technology Society program, which is where, which is how Alex and I indirectly met. Mm -hmm. Which program was that again? The uh, Science Technology and Society. Okay, yeah, right. Okay, so in 2017, I taught a course, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Triple Helix, and a colleague of his, uh, Walney. Yeah, Triple Helix is his thing. Yeah, I, I read it. I saw it on your yeah, link. Yeah. 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 yeah, so Walney from Curitiba uh, showed up along with several other senior people from this wellness program in the medical school that takes in people at 50000 a year, mm. and they can basically hang out, go to any course that a faculty member will let them into. Mm. And so three or four of them showed up at my seminar, which was an undergraduate seminar. And the idea was to study the, quote, Stanford Innovation System. Mm. And uh, so was, we all divided them into teams, and they worked up an interview guide, and they went out. <clears throat> and in the perspective for the seminar, I said, we're going to publish the results. My original idea was simply that this would go into an undergraduate type journal. Mm -hmm. But the results were coming back in such a good level, mm -hmm. especially with the participation of people like Walney mm -hmm. and Tim Scopa, uh, VC from San Francisco. Yeah, this uh, Walney is one of those guys that are in the ecosystem of a uh, university. He's, he was actually uh, my colleague. He was probably two years uh, older than me when we were in, in, in under, actually as undergrads. And then when uh, he graduated at that time in the 80s, <coughs> Well, he graduated and he was invited to become a professor right away, or, or a lecturer or whatever, uh -huh. right? And so he en ended up even teaching a class to, to, hmm. my, to my group, who <laughs> were two years uh, behind them or, or something. But then uh, he started this company. That became one of the biggest, uh, well, well, it, 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 became, it, it got into stock market in Brazil, which is a thing here, any small company gets into the stock market, but over there we only have some 600 companies ah. in the stock market. So, so they got there. Uh, and uh, and he's still a, a lecturer at the university. He never, I mean, he, he I think he, he, he most of the work that he, he his IP was related to a master's uh, uh, work that he but did. But he sold and the company. He came back. Yeah, he uh, sold the company. And then came here mm -hmm. to see next stage what he might do, and showed up at my seminar with all these people. Serendipitous. So, yes. Yeah, so anyway, we published a series of articles. Uh, one of them invited by David Teese. Uh, for uh, economics journal, another technology forecast, and, and social change. And then Walney introduced us, and now the idea has been 
uh, to continue the study that we did at Stanford and do it at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. ah, and that's what brings us here. Oh, cool. And basically, we're, we're trying to understand how the, eco, the, the Berkeley ecosystem, well, not only, um, we think it's, it's an emerging thing more than anything else, right? Uh, but, uh, and well, you, uh, everyone, when, whenever we show, that, that this is one of your slides there, and whenever we show that, they, they say, yeah, this is a uh, Mike's thing. <laughs> I don't know if you're, if you're the father of the, the drawing. Uh, some, some love, others hate, even the ones that hate, they, they, they hate because they said, yes, the problem is that we can we cannot organize these things uh, in a in a better way because you know these guys do this but they also do that and uh, but anyway uh, everyone points uh, to you and, and say yeah this is uh, uh, and this is an important mapping because before that it seems that nobody knew what was around or so there's another map I'll send you as a link. This the one? Pentagon. Yeah, the Pentagon. Yeah, so I, I had. I, I didn't know that you had like that, so I printed it because I also went, we also wanted to know about that. Yeah. 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 Right, right. So. You could tell us a bit about yourself and and, uh, your and, 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 and how how you came up with this and, and, and if you think that there are other things that are that are not spotted here or and, and, and also what what is big here and what is uh, support and right so before I launch that can you just clarify you, uh, your research what what is the can, it just, you're just studying the ecosystem the university yeah. ecosystem. I mean, okay it's broad uh, I'll, t I'll tell you my hypothesis okay yeah. okay uh, Berkeley is second mover in this area, uh, but potentially has uh, greater firepower in terms of faculty, uh, PhD students, postdocs. Uh, and so concentrated in this direction, it has the potential to overtake Stanford and become the leader in the field in the Bay Area. Well, that's an interesting way to put it, uh, second mover, as if we're really in direct competition with Stanford. Yeah, like a business. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I'm not quite sure I'd, I'd like the analogy because um, I'm not quite sure I see them as businesses or, or direct competitors. Like okay, would, but yeah. uh, let's put, put it in the broader context. Uh, they've been direct competitors as research universities for, for decades. Not originally, because Stanford was so far behind. Uh, but then it uh, came up uh, partly by adopting this entrepreneurial university model. Uh, that's my view of how Stanford grew up as a research university even, uh, that's how it got the resources uh, to uh, go where it is today, which is arguably on smaller but on equal par with Berkeley, which it wasn't 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Berkeley was clearly the leading research university and Stanford was nowhere near. Right, right, yeah, right, right. That's true too. You know, by the way, I, I'm a good friend of David T. since I've read some of his stuff about how he compares and contrasts T. And we actually like to compare ourselves more to MIT, but, but that's another story. Um, but yes, yeah, so the second move of greater firepower. There again, on the second comment, greater firepower, it's not necessarily apples to apples, and one key difference is that Stanford has a medical school. And medical school has really changed an ecosystem, uh, any ecosystem in ways that, um, although we do a lot of collaboration with UCSF, it's still, and it is part of the University of California, it's not as integrated as Stanford's mm -hmm. medical school. You, you, that, that you mean mainly for the for life sciences and and, and, yeah. and for for yeah. biotech and things right. like that. There's a lot of life sciences huh. here, and it's a growing area. But like for example, uh, medical schools have clinical; they can do clinical mm -hmm. work that mm -hmm. is important for transit translational research and and commercialization. So that's why you know comparing Stanford and Berkeley is not completely apples to apples, and and especially at the OTL level because. Mm -hmm. Also, medical schools are responsible for a lot of um, intellectual property, a lot of patent rights and things. So, but nonetheless, uh, you're right. We're definitely uh, second movers in some respects, and we we do think that um, uh, it, a lot has been changing over the last several years, and there's a lot of potential here. And, and, and I, you know, I I wonder how you measure when you say greater firepower, and you know what your metric is. Maybe more startups or more successful startups. Not clear. By firepower, I mean research the, uh, the size size of the res resources in terms of. Numbers of faculty. I'm right now doing a participant observation study at the chemistry department at Stanford. And in the research group there, they recognize that uh, Berkeley chemistry is several times larger. And in fact, uh, right now, Stanford is moving to increase its size. Uh, just, uh, and I would say uh, that's partly if due to uh, Berkeley's being on this larger scale. Mm. And not only Berkeley, but the other major research universities. Yeah, Stanford right. is relatively small. Mm. Yeah, and, and that, that's true. It's a matter of scale. Yeah, uh, true, they, right. they, they don't have, and although they, they're, they're trying to go that way, possibly, uh, it's, it's not easy to scale a uh, university. Anyway, and uh, they're now, well, this is another story, but they're now as tightly hemmed in as Newcastle was 
in downtown uh, Newcastle, a very old city, mm -hmm. very difficult to expand. Mm -hmm. Stanford, now even though it has a huge land area, it's as tightly hemmed in as Newcastle because of the restrictions on land use placed by the county and the city. That's another interesting perspective because when we think about land use here, it's another thing that I'm working on uh, closely here at Berkeley is... Um, yeah, you do a lot with the, the, the municipality, right? Uh, yeah, in fact, I just came from a meeting there with Berkeley Startup Cluster. And by the way, the person we were talking to, um, there's a startup called Lioness. It deals with women's health. And there's an example of how the, the Berkeley and the um, Stanford ecosystems are not competitors because Lioness grew out of uh, some of Berkeley stuff but ended up not only in Skydeck but also in StartX. StartX mm -hmm. is the Stanford you know, accelerator. Mm -hmm. So they're, in other words, these companies, these startups are taking advantage of both Stanford and Berkeley. So it's not why, you know, there's direct competition. Yeah, not, not, but yeah. Maybe, maybe that's, 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 a, at, the, that's at, the, at the ground level. Yeah. A startup takes advantage of any resources yeah, right. in the area. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. And so uh, there's no incubator in Stanford. So a biotech company that I've been tracking for a decade, they went to UCSF QB3, of course. But back to this topic of land use, which is something that we've um, been focused on quite a bit lately, because you know I have this model of a vortex versus a waypoint mm -hmm. campus, and how I don't explain that. Yeah, all right. And this, and then let me don't let me forget to come back to land use. So, uh, the uh, one one um, uh, uh, key assumption is that um, the 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 best university innovation entrepreneurship ecosystems have as a key attribute a supercritical mass of human talent across multiple areas, science, engineering, business, marketing, and uh, that's key at MIT and also in and around Stanford. And one of the ways that you build that um, supercritical mass of human talent is by not by changing from being a waypoint campus to a vortex campus. And most campuses, university campuses, are waypoints. And my favorite example is Cornell, which is a great STEM university. Yes. Every year, great students come in. Many of them are entrepreneurial. Yeah. March out afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, and they contribute to the uh, ecosystem. And then when they graduate, most of them disperse. They don't stay in Ithaca. Uh, but every year uh, there are some vortex camps like at MIT where great students come in, students, faculty, postdocs, mm -hmm. they contribute to the campus ecosystem. When they graduate, a lot of them stay to work and live in the vicinity. And year after year of that dynamic uh, kind of uh, uh, spins up this super critical mass of human talent in and around the campus and they are successful, they give back, they're mentors, they're investors. And so we... Uh, feedbacks and grows yeah. the ecosystem. Yeah, right. One of the most interesting statistics I've ever seen is that more MIT graduates found startups in Silicon Valley than around MIT? It's maybe true, um, and so they contribute to Stanford's ecosystem at Vortex, but there are also a lot in and around Cambridge. True. Yeah, mm -hmm. So I mean, true. they had they had enough to go around for yeah. both. Um, and uh, and so at Berkeley, um, uh, when I first started here, almost all of our startups. When was that? That was um, uh, two thousand and two. Uh, and uh, what did you find when you got here? Well, nothing related to startups. But let me just finish this story yeah. that in, okay. uh, w uh, years ago, when startups spun out of the UC Berkeley campus, most of them just ended up going to the Stanford Vortex down in Silicon Valley. They, they moved <laughs> to Mountain yeah. View. If Sun Microsystems is a great example. You know, Unix was done here, but it ended up in, in Mountain View. And, um, and so we were a waypoint, not a vortex. And so uh, over the last several years, with the advent of Skydeck, have you been to Skydeck? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and some of the other stuff going around here. WeWorks is a five-story building over here. Uh, we're becoming more of a vortex, but still we're having, we don't have the space, like MIT's Kendall Square is an amazing example of what, what you could build when you have a commercial area adjacent to a, a university, research university. And so we're trying to do that in downtown Berkeley, but we don't, the, the properties, we don't have a lot of opportunity sites. And, um, so, anyways, well, I, I have a paper on this. I'll say yeah, this, this is a, you, know, he, you, 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 you probably haven't seen it yet. He, he sent last night, right? This is, isn't well, isn't no, it this one? No, no, it's, no? It's, oh. uh, it, you know, it's not specifically on land use strategy for Berkeley. And again, there again, we compare ourselves uh -huh. to MIT. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it has a because one curious thing that you write here is that you, when you're talking about the possibility of a university becoming a vortex university, and it says, oh, sometimes you have the preponderance of local citizens who have an anti-growth, anti-university, and corresponding anti-business mentality. I ask, is this Berkeley? <laughs> because Berkeley. not not anti-university, but definitely 
anti-growth and, and maybe anti-business mentality. Right. It was Berkeley, by the way, when I, I studied other universities in Ann Arbor, you know, University of Michigan, they have a, they, they, for years that, that, that community, uh, Ann Arbor, didn't want the university mm -hmm. to grow. So there's an antagonism. And in fact, that was the case for many years. And it's still, there's still a, a tension. There's a tension in Palo Alto, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So that's, that's a good give and take. Mm -hmm. It's natural. But Berkeley was harsher. And I remember when we uh, founded the Skydeck, and for the first time, we had the chancellor, the mayor, and all these other entrepreneurial people in the same room, and everyone was like, wow, what a difference. So, we, how did that come about? Well, okay, I'll tell you the sky deck. I mean, yes. there's a lot of stories, but yes. um, I don't like talking about myself, but if you ask, I'll, I'll tell you that I, I started out as an engineer, uh, worked at HP. Uh, I, I went, I got, got an uh, undergraduate degree at Tufts in Boston. Uh, and then uh, worked at Hewlett Packard in uh, systems engineering. Here in this neighborhood, uh, uh, they, I was based in. Um, they had a HP had a sites in you know on 128. 128. That used to be the uh, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley of. That used to be that was DEC. Yeah, well, DEC was there. Mm -hmm. HP was there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Sun's big competitor Apollo was there. Uh, a lot of the big computer companies were out on 128 at that time. Yes. Yeah. And so, but HP flew me back to California for many, several big projects. Mm -hmm. And so I got to know the HP way uh, down, you know, there's sites in Palo Alto and Cupertino. And um, <clears throat> so that led me to go back and get an MBA at Harvard. And then this after- around what time? Uh, with the uh, action. The years. The years, that was uh, 85, I, I mm -hmm. 87, graduated, and then came out to work for Sun Microsystems during the heyday of the Unix workstation server markets and product management. Mm -hmm. So product management was a great place for me because first of all I was an engineer and, and now I understood marketing and business and so when you're a product manager you run a little business yep. so, and first I started with, yeah. uh, with actually um, peripherals and then workstations and servers and then product lines and pro by the time um, th and then um, there was a small company called MIPS Computer System uh, yes. spun out of um, both risk computing here at Ber um, Berkeley and also Stanford but there again like Sun <coughs> MIPS ended up down in Sunnyvale mm -hmm. not here. Mm -hmm. With, yes. Um, even though the, a lot of the risk work was done up here. Yes, right. but uh, the entrepreneuring came from uh, a professor up there. Uh, yeah, Dave Patterson was the key risk professor, but so so was the uh, Ber uh, Hennessy. Hennessy. Yeah, right. Yeah, was also a, a co-founder of MIPS. Yes. Anyways, I, I, uh, MIPS was a small company at the time, and they, they kind of found me. I ended up doing the product management for MIPS, and went, went through that through the IPO, and then um, who was running MIPS? Bob Miller. Who was um, came from Data General? Uh -huh. And what was the role of the two professors? Uh, they were only. Uh, I remember John Hennessy was around a lot, just hanging out. But they were just advisors. They they didn't have operating roles. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a great place to work. And again, we were just cranking out product. But Sun at MIPS, and it was so. I learned a lot about business and, and technology and information technology, in particular, both software and hardware. Uh, and then Silicon Graphics bought MIPS. And, what was uh, Henry doing hanging out? When Henry, uh, he mostly just, you know, he was just a friendly guy just talking to people. Like, he would come, I would write these product plans. This is back when we used to write these elaborate product plans. You know, uh, here's the product, uh, you know, market and vision and spec and roadmap. And, you know, he'd read them and come back and have them circled and he'd ask me questions about the strategy. <laughs> and it was just, it was very, uh, it was very friendly. And, uh, you know, it was, we were all trying to just, it was a meritocracy. Trying to yeah. get the best thing out of it. But he was interested in the bigger picture. He said straight. Yeah, but yeah, right, right. Yeah. Especially, uh, you know, I was working more. MIPS did um, instruction sets um, at, um, as well as com uh, computer systems, and I was more on the computer system side. So he was like to see that that growth. You know, I could talk about the the strengths and weaknesses of the MIPS strategy. It's a whole other area and things like that. But that's kind of yeah. you know, beyond the scope. So? Yeah. Um, and then Silicon Graphics bought MIPS, and I w worked in. I ended up managing the Silicon Graphics. Um, Product line of servers, which at that time was a hundred million dollar business, which was you know for, for me that was kind of exciting stuff. But also I was I, I got I knew a lot of people in the valley there I, at, um, at Intel and other companies, and we you know we wanted to create our own startup, and so who's we? The all my colleagues and friends that were in that area. Hey, sorry for interrupting, but Stephen Donaldson is here to see you. Uh, does he think he's? Uh, doing a video now? I guess so. I, don't know. I thought that was next week, Steve. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we got our, our signals crossed. Uh, and I also thought, well, you know, you could set up, excuse me for just a second.
about lots of interesting information. Yeah. You know, coincidentally, you know, this is, a, they're doing a video shoot for David Teese. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, and they're interviewing people, because Teese is doing some kind of, um, this summer, he's meeting in Edinburgh or Edinburgh or something like that, and they're doing some kind of economic forum, and anyway, so, uh -huh. so uh, at 1230, I got to go, uh, they're, they're uh -huh. interviewing other people. So anyways, um, back to Silicon Graphics, so uh, we, we, were, we started, we were looking at startups and everything, and this might have been not my best career move, but... Um, you know, as, as companies were spinning out of Silicon Graphics, like there's people, from, you know, related to Netscape there and everything, I decided to go into this startup. I had an opportunity to work for Mayfield, the venture capital firm. Um, I, but I decided to go into this startup, and we were looking at different spaces. We were applying, um, at the time we thought that with internet connectivity, graphical user interfaces, uh, uh, smaller computing, all, um, all these kind of things, um, all the manual interfaces would become soft interfaces, graphical user interfaces. And so yes. we were looking for uh, all kinds of markets to apply that um, technology to. And um, and then we were from a variety of companies around the yeah, valley? right. Uh -huh. uh, particularly Intel, and then sort of people from Sun, and I was at SGI. So there was like there was some of the, the co-founders. And uh, so we had some athletes on our team. And uh, you know, we looked at cast register, for example. Now cast registers are all graphical user interfaces. Mm -hmm. We looked at medical products. But you know what we wanted to do for the fun of it? We wanted to take cardiovascular equipment like uh, treadmills and steppers and take that manual interface and create, a, you know, instead of a desktop, a sweat top. Mm -hmm. And so we create this whole environment where we have um, applications and content. And now if you go to mm -hmm. a modern gym, mm -hmm. uh, all the, yeah. you know, it's all that's, that's, that's what they have. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So we, we created the hardware and software, we grew that company, we, we, um, and, um, and we merged it with a company in Canada, and um, yeah, that was relatively successful, but then the dot-com boom, the bust hit, and so as I was, um, after that merger, the company careened into bankruptcy because it was growing big fast. You know, that was the mantra, mm -hmm. grow big fast. Mm -hmm. So we, um, and also, the other thing about that company was so we start out with with a sweat top and all these user interfaces, but then we realized when we were bringing the internet in, we could start to put advertising on it. Like back then, it was um, <clears throat> advertising banners. Uh, banners, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just hooked the computers into the banner networks, like a thing called uh, double click, and all of a sudden they were making money. I mean, you, you could put a, a, that equipment into a gym, and just because you had these people captive for 20 to 60 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It was an amazing environment, and so the the equipment was generating all this revenue from the ad networks, mm -hmm. and so we started to put them in free, and so that's how all the debt started to pile up. And so, anyways, so uh, it turns out my one of the co-founders, Tom Pru, who was the um, co-founder of Intuit, he, he was the first author of mm -hmm. Quicken. Um, he pulled that company out of bankruptcy because it was profitable, and, and NetPulse. If you do a search on NetPulse, you know it's do, doing pretty well today. Anyways, um, after um, NetPulse, I started to have a young family. And my wife is a professor at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And so she's a professor, professional and she's very into her research. And I was doing all this work. And so as we had this young family, we realized that, gee, our kids are being raised by nannies and uh, it's not really healthy. So one of us had to make a compromise. And as you know, the life of a professor mm -hmm. is pretty unique. Mm -hmm. You know, research, you know, tenured mm -hmm. research university professor, they have a lot of autonomy, they do their own thing and mm -hmm. she loved to work. So I, I compromised. And I found this job at Berkeley that basically leveraged my tech marketing and biz de development skills. But basically, um, I was home every night for dinner, all weekends. Mm -hmm. I became the dad mm -hmm. of the family. Fascinating. Usually, it's women who take right. that job yeah. to have a nine to five mm -hmm. exactly and leave right. academia. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of radical for me. And I have to mm -hmm. tell you, at times, it was tough for my ego. Mm -hmm. this was, again, this is a longer yeah. story. I could go off on a tangent on. But, um, but you know, basically, um, that was to kind of save the family. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it was so many things that worked so well. You know, uh, you and that's when you started, the, I mean, when yeah. you moved into the university yeah, right, and right. started uh, getting involved with uh, licensing. Right, so to, to be honest, I mean, I, I, it sounds obnoxious, but I came to this position, I was very overqualified. 
mm-hmm. but I understood it's all about compromise and trade-offs in life. Mm-hmm. And so I had the right mindset, this is what I'm just going to do, and I'm going to be the key father, the mm-hmm. dad of the family. So what was here when you arrived? So it was pretty much just focused on licensing. And um, and I, I, because I have an interest in startups, I started to study the startups. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I, I first started do this initial research that led mm-hmm. to the four M's that you mentioned mm-hmm. in, um, yeah, in that, email. That, that's fair, yeah. I looked at about 50 startups from both University, UC Berkeley and the National Lab, both of those that are successful and failed. I basically did case studies on them. Mm-hmm. In and, this region? Uh, from UC Berkeley and from the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lawrence National Lab. Yeah. So okay. um, yeah, both uh, across all uh, sectors, uh, uh, life sciences, information technology. To, and, and so I just started to do case studies on them, see what their story was. And that's when I observed that maybe these, there's these four common patterns, morphed, mined, milked, and marketed. And that's how a lot of these startups kind of emerge. And uh, so I, then I started looking at those four pathways and s- to see how we could maximize them. <laughs> and one of the early observations is a lot of them aren't getting licenses. You know, you don't need to, in certain sectors, like for example, software, you don't need a, you, there's not a lot of patenting, you know, they, they, they want to open source the software. So, the, so they're not, the OTL uh, is not even, you know, involved with that startup. But this goes back to your early comment about not being systematic. Mm-hmm. And likewise, that was the case here. And um, so again, looking at these four patterns, wondering, can, there, can we add some more systematic processes? Can so we try to do that, where Stanford rejected that? I don't know if you would say they rejected, but you know, because it's, it's, it's not binary, it's not like... No, but, they, but they did realize that the path didn't work outside of biotech. They closed down that part of the office. Oh, really? They yes. actually closed it down? While I was there. Hmm. Yes, it was announced no more two groups, only one. Hmm. Interesting. No, because they couldn't figure out how to deal with that through the licensing model. Yeah. yeah this, this but they were focused on the licensing model and kept that focus. Because I think this model brings you uh, or puts the licensing model in, into a different perspective. It's not focused on intellectual property. You, you even bring, depending on where you are here, you even, okay. you're also commercializing know-how to, right, to some yeah. extent, right? And Usually. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. Okay. It's, it's interesting that, you know, by the way, this office was started by the guy from Stanford, Niels. Um, Reimers. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So this, a lot of the initial best practices you know, was basically taken from Stanford. And you know, and it's doing quite well. Um, but again, this kind of realization started to look at these pathways. And you know, if you look at them just as an example, uh, you know, morphed. I don't know if you want me to just quickly highlight them, but uh, morphed mm-hmm. occur, occurs when um, members of a research team just organically move from um, the applied research to a prototype, maybe to an alpha and beta product. And before you know, they're spinning out a company. That occurred a lot in, in um, startups that didn't require a lot of capital, especially in software internet areas. Then there was the mine pathway, which occurred when entrepreneurs in and around the campus um, mined um, uh, technology opportunities for, uh, for courses, like back then it was business plan competitions and things like that. And when they struck something that interested them, they'd form a team, write a business plan, and that was the mine pathway. And by the way, one key difference between Stanford and Berkeley at the time was Stanford's uh, business school has always had a strong focus on entrepreneurship. So those, those Stanford MBAs were mining that campus quite a bit. In fact, Scott McNeely, was a, um, who started Sun Microsystems, was a Stanford MBA as an example. The, the, the UC Berkeley Business School at that time did not have a strong orientation towards tech entrepreneurship. It was more into real estate and economics and things it like that. It came later with clean yeah. tech. To, it came yeah. much yeah. later. Clean yeah. tech was a big initiator of that. Right. So the, our mind pathway of, of, uh, of startups was a lot weaker than Stanford's and likewise MIT's because the Sloan School had a strong entrepreneurship yes. pathway. So the, the MBA programs uh, in the mind pathway are very um, uh, important together. That was so morphed mind uh, milked occurs when a company that's collaborating on sponsored research, an established company, takes some of the innovations, brings them in house into their R and D, and commercializes them. Here's a big difference between Stanford and Berkeley. There again, at that time, Stanford had a huge amount of corporate sponsored research. That was how they grew up. They didn't, this Berkeley grew up on government uh, yes. funding. And so we didn't have a lot of corporate sponsored research for that area. That pathway wasn't that strong for us. Now, of course, with state funding going down, you know, 10, 15 years later, we have a huge amount of mm-hmm. uh, corporate sponsored research. And that, uh, that um, mind path, that, um, that milk pathway is working quite well. The final pathway is the marketed pathway. And that occurs because the fact of the matter is that universities, a lot of the innovations 
are, um, are too early for commercialization. The products aren't proven, the technology's not proven, the markets are too nascent. So a lot of times what we do is it kind of, we, we patent it because we think it has potential, and then we periodically market it to entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and companies, and eventually maybe the timing becomes right, and, 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 and I can give you a lot of examples of that. Now, now you're even bundling it, right, and which, which seems uh, also an exciting way of uh, marketing this, marketing several patents together. Or that's Yeah, that's, uh, that, especially in certain sectors, that's uh -huh. a key part of this. So, anyway, so that, but that research um, on, on those 50 case studies and those four M's and then yeah, trying where, to maximize where are all these materials at? Can we, can I have, can we have yeah, access to they're it? All, yeah, it's yeah, all there? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah, okay. yeah. And the raw data? The raw data is more in my notes and mm -hmm. part of the presentations. I mean, the companies are in there and everything. But okay. one thing that I'm, I'm curious about here is, I, I know that this is probably much more like a, a, a a vision of, uh, of possibilities and, and, and where different ways of uh, commercializing IP and know-how uh, could happen. Uh, but what do you think that should be, let's say, if, if you were doing it right, if the university was ready for this, what do you think should be the proportion of uh, knowledge IP commercialized in each one of these uh, through, through these because it seems to me that as, as you become more entrepreneurial, as, as, as uh, morphed becomes a, well, uh, a more important, more relevant way of doing it, and even more, maybe even more safer way uh, mm. to some extent. Although many of these companies collapse uh, soon, many do, right? Right. right. Yeah. Right. But but uh, do you have an uh, have you thought of ideas of the the, the the balance of percentages here would be? Yeah. That's a good question. Well, and it goes back again to this systematic versus um, more organic kind mm -hmm. of uh, environment. And there again, so that's that was actually, this is a good question because it leads into the second part of my research, which was <clears throat> in trying to maximize those pathways, we can do things systematically, or how do you just make things happen? Or how do you um, maximize just the, the uh, spontaneity, the, um, uh, the, the organic possibilities? And so I started to study uh, other universities on this, and like for example, I started to realize that it's important to do systematic work, systematic processes. Even like the whole licensing organization um, can be a little more systematic in that. For example, licensing, some people saw it when I arrived as, it's a toll. It's, it's like, you know, you're extracting money from these, these companies that are trying to commercialize the technology where you can actually do it in a way that it's a catalyst because you're giving people a competitive advantage that helps their business model, mm -hmm. helps them raise money. So mm -hmm. even the mindset of, of how to license, which is a paper I sent you last night, yeah. kind of uh, mindset of mm -hmm. licensing the startups, and making it more of a catalyst, mm -hmm. not uh, just a toll. Mm -hmm. um, an asset, the, the license being an asset and not uh, yeah, but something that you have to pay to have access to, to business. or Right. right. And, I, and I, when I started, I, I believe a lot of the people here, um, they, they had a hard harshness. They didn't realize how hard it is to start a company. Mm -hmm. And I think the terms that, we, that were, were very harsh on startups, and mm -hmm. I think we've come a long way making the terms more amenable to startups and their investors and things. We've just become much more sensitive to that the IP is a fraction of what it takes to become successful, mm -hmm. and, and that realization really changes kind of how you license. But um, <clears throat> So uh, then back to the uh, systematic versus organic. So one good example was University of Utah. At the time, I remember Utah saying, we have now surpassed MIT in the number of startups coming out of the mm -hmm. campus. So just, oh, God, I'm go over there. They were all, all bakeries and... <laughs> well, not so much, but, but you know, a lot of them, it turns out, ultimately the market has to decide on whether a company's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And it looked like Utah was just, like, they were creating websites for them and doing the marketing. And some of them didn't even have people. They just, they, they were basically University of Utah people. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, kind of bolstering these startups, and eventually most of them failed. But so you can only do systematic stuff can only go so far mm -hmm. because ultimately the market decides. If you can grow the organic part, which you know all these resources and people and all the um, serendipitous meetings like you've had, mm -hmm. that that's really great. Well, yeah, this, Utah has a gap in kind of the research background and resources. They're trying to leverage a very small base, mm -hmm. and they, they didn't build the base sufficiently. Um, it's true, they didn't build that, that one, one observation, it's true, but also, then again... But that's the part that is almost impossible to build in another way than not organically, right? Uh, well, you, you, then again, you, another, as I started to think about how uh, universities can become... Some of you say that to, be, to really grow the organic part, yeah, it's good to become more of a vortex, because there again, now you bring in the super critical yeah. mass of human talent, and I realized that some universities are just not going to be able to create that vortex where they are. Like, for example, let's go back to Cornell, or mm -hmm. you know, um, 
So that's why I think if a university can't build their vortex locally, then they, one strategy is to branch out to a place where they can build a vortex. So I was just in New York City uh, where uh, Cornell Tech is now located, yes. the Technion. And th so th that branching out to New York City where they can build that vortex is part of their strategy. Likewise, um, CMU has a huge campus now in, in Mountain View. Wharton has a big campus in, in uh, San Francisco because all of their, their MBAs and professors mm -hmm. want to come out here. Mm -hmm. So you, either you can't, if you can't build it locally in Philadelphia, then you branch out to where you can. And there's insufficient universities in this region. Yeah. And then, in fact, so I did, as an aside, I was once working with a, a provost here. You know, Berkeley's gone, kind of gone through some budget ups and downs. Yes. And with one of those uh, uh, downs, he, I can say this paper's on my website about um, what makes Berkeley great. You know, during this budget crisis, how can we make things that great? And so I, I did kind of a competitive analysis of universities. Mm -hmm. And in that analysis, I realized, wow, there's a dearth of great, compared to like Boston, um, or, or even like in the parts of the UK where you were, yes. you know, they, they, we could support a few more great research universities. Exactly, that's the conclusion in one of those papers uh, yeah. I've done, yeah, uh, is that uh, potentially Boston could outdo Silicon Valley because uh, all of these universities that have grown up to front rank in the past 30 years, right, right. whereas we're still at the same two and a half here. Yeah. But as a tangent, you know, I see what's happening in Boston, like for example, what I think Harvard is doing with their new innovation zone. You know, they, they bought all this um, space uh, on the other side of the river, adjacent to the business school in Austin. And, Austin. and um, now they moved their engineering uh, yeah. there. And so the business school, the engineering school, there's all this office space that they're building, this innovation zone. And by the way, it's, it's practically adjacent to MIT mm -hmm. across yeah. the river. And then there's mm -hmm. Boston University right over there. Mm -hmm. So in 10 years or 20, 15, 20 years, that is going to be an amazing vortex of technology driven by those universities in that proximity, in yeah. that super critical mass of talent. Yeah. Anyways, so, so, uh, th that, so I, my point is I looked at universities and their strategy for creating vortex versus waypoints and, and the, how they can spin up their innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem. And so that's where I, I'm focusing now, again, with Berkeley on land use and trying to make this more of a, an area, or West Berkeley more of an area for, for not just startups, but you know, you really win when they become, you keep them when they become large companies. Mm -hmm. So in an image before, you brought together the people in the room from the city, from, how did that happen? Well, so uh, first, kind of well actually, just because you're, 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 you're scholars in this area, I would tell you that actually the way it happened is, first it was a systematic effort. The chancellor, the director of the lab, the Berkeley mayor, the Richmond mayor, because that's what the, Berkeley has a, a facility in Richmond, came together and um, this is during the, um, this is about 2007 or six, where um, before the financial crisis. Yeah. Uh, yes. Exactly. But um, it kind of played into this. So, anyways, there was a lot of uh, interest in um, in, in uh, energy, and mm. and, uh, uh, and and also just bio biofuels, mm. things like that. So they decided to create this thing called the uh, the, the um, uh, East Bay. Green Corridor, the East Bay Green Corridor. Who convened this group? So it was the Chancellor. Here. Yeah, it was, it was a top-down thing. Yes. Chancellor, uh, Director of the Lab, Berkeley Mayor, and then Richmond Mayor. Then they brought in the Oakland Mayor, and so they created this thing called the East Bay Green Corridor. There's still a website there. <laughs> and uh, just coincidentally, they asked me to be a representative on it because of my interest in this exact area. And so through the East Bay Green Corridor, I got to know all the economic development managers in, in the East Bay, and then especially the people in Berkeley. And then through my report with people in Berkeley were saying, why, do, why can't we make Berkeley more of a, of a, we didn't use the word vortex at the time, we wanted to create, uh, we wanted to create accelerators here, the incubators accelerators, but we didn't have any money. Hmm. But I was going around talking to all the, the groups that, in, in, in this area, about this notion of the Berkeley, it's called the Berkeley Startup Cluster. That okay. created. All the groups, who are the groups? All, all, anyone who is tech oriented, uh, either a resident of Berkeley or a company of Berkeley, in Berkeley, we started talking about the Berkeley Startup Cluster. And, uh, and so one of those people was Intel. Intel had a little lablet on the um, penthouse floor of this building. Mm -hmm. And in that lablet, they had collaborations with Berkeley. And so, in, uh, so they were big fans of the Berkeley Star Plus. They got, got the vision right away. And um, so at the beginning of 2011, the director invited me upstairs in January. He said, Mike, good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is that, um, no, the bad news is we're, we're the good news is that we're going to uh, uh, fund more research at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. The bad news is we're shutting down all of our lablets. The one at Berkeley, the one at CMU, the one at University of Washington. So 
I looked around and I said, wow, this could be an amazing accelerator. If, can you leave all of your stuff here? You know, the <laughs> desk, the refrigerators, you know, the beanbag shears, the foosball tables. And sure enough, Intel agreed to leave all that stuff behind. And so now we tried to create a business model to turn this into a, uh, an accelerator. And first, I had this, I, I didn't think, the university was going through another one of its budget crises, which is again different between Stanford and Berkeley <laughs> and MIT. And, um, and so the first business model I could send you was basically, it was just stipends from university people at like College of Engineering. And I was going to get private funding from law firms and venture capital firms, all to create this kind of like the StartX. Yes. And so uh, I went over to the College of Engineering Dean, Shankar Shastri, and I presented this. And after like 10 minutes, he said, Mike, stop selling. I'm with you. <laughs> but here's, we're going to do it differently. Instead, we're going to switch it around. We're going to give you two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We get two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the business school and two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the uh, vice chancellor research, and we're going to we're going to ramp this thing up as a university startup facility. Mm -hmm. Despite the downturn. Yes, I couldn't believe. It. I, some, I told myself, "Where are you going to find that money?" It turns out, you know, they have money squirreled away. College of Engineering also was, you know, mm -hmm. the campus was maybe having a bunch of problems, but the College of Engineering and the business yeah. school, so you know, were. Yes. But still, <clears throat> so Shank, so Dean was behind me, mm -hmm. but I. As I started to present this, this is another, again, it's another story, I don't know, if, but I can tell you that it, people told me, it, people said it could be done and it should be done. The university should be involved with commercial entities. You said should or should it, it could not be should done not and, and it should be done. Who yeah, said that's, should that's the research. Yeah, yeah the, mo most yeah. people. Who's most people? On I don't know if I want to name names. No. Okay, the type of people. Professors, pr probably. Uh, All, okay. Senior administration and the staff around that. You know, said one thing said no or yes? Said it should be done and it can't be done. Because they were okay, still too should be done research for it. It should not be done okay. and it cannot be done. And did they give reasons? Yes. What you know, universities should, or, or research. non profit universities should be focused on research education and this is getting involved with commercial entities. We can't support that. We can't support it and we shouldn't support it. Okay. So, uh, I, I can send you this, all this stuff and everything. I even yes, have uh, all the emails uh, on this. <laughs> yes, and, this is um, interesting. Again, Love that. this is, uh, pe people told me I was creating problems and I should just stop. And um, I, I don't want to go into this because it's all like yeah. water under the bridge. But um, anyways, one of the ways we started to turn the perspective is experiential learning. It started to mm -hmm. become very um, uh, trendy. Uh, and so you brought it into the educational realm. Right. You know, doing startups, they may fail, but they're doing them, and it's experiential learning, and it's just great. And now it's almost like um, mm -hmm. uh, going on an internship. Mm -hmm. And these people are, you know, you've got to love them. These kids and everything are doing this and everything. So we eventually um, funded Skydeck, and, um, and that was the first... Was that how it, made, it became acceptable to the administration, that it was education? That it was, uh, 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 yes, that was one of the... the Parts of it. Even then, when we started, there were people that, that, that didn't want to do it and didn't want to fund it, and uh, and so it struggled. Uh, what else in addition to education was the selling point? Well, some people also had the vision. For example, let's go to talk about Tees. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's at the business school. Yes. Also, you know, Tees is a major he's business. Owner, this the owner of the building. <laughs> yeah. And so, through a connection, you know, um, I, again, all, I was colleagues with the economic development people and everything. I, I met with David Teese at his office in, uh, in um, Emeryville. He he's also runs this thing called the Berkeley uh, BCG, Berkeley yes. uh, Consulting Group. And uh, so uh, we also, at the time, had this thing called, uh, this presentation called, If You Build It, you, They Will Stay. If, they, if you build mm -hmm. it, they will stay. So we went around mm -hmm. and took that to all the major building developer owners and, um, and you know, people that ran buildings in this area. Almost all of them said, just, I just want a good lease. I don't care about your vision. I'm not going to build something that you think is going to create. Uh, we said, there are all these startups here looking for stuff. If you build something for them, they'll stay <laughs> instead of going to Silicon Valley. <laughs> Tease got it in a second. And again, in that presentation, he says, I get it. And um, so he helped us convince the campus to set up the Sky Deck. And he helped convince the management of the building to give us kind of a break on the lease in the first three mm -hmm. years. And so so he had a foot in both worlds, yes. yeah. right. mm -hmm. the business world and the academic mm -hmm. world, and he could convince both, he had credibility in both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, yeah, so, so some of the, the real stars in this kind of, with, with the big turn in our ecosystem with Skydeck was the, uh, the Shanker Shastri, the Dean of College of Engineering, David Teese, who was the owner of a key mm -hmm. investor in the building and a business school professor.
Um, so uh, Skydeck ramped up, and then um, uh, then all things started to happen. Uh, we got Cyclotron Road came to the uh, Cyclotron yep. Road. It's a, it's a research accelerator associated with the National Lab, Citrus Foundry, QB3, um, and so all this all this entrepreneurial stuff started to grow. Uh, Where did they come from? These initiatives. Each one, like for example, when I first uh, proposed the Skydeck. QB3, this is, I don't know if you're familiar with QB3, yes. they, they were based in UCSF, yes. but, so they had an accelerator there, incubator well, there. But it's QB3, it's because three, it, it's three universities are also no, Santa Cruz. No, it's, no, it's quantitative, it's in the name, it's uh, oh, okay. bio, biological, it, it's part, it happens to be three campuses, yeah. but it, yeah. the three oh, is... It's, oh, the yeah. three is for something else, yeah, okay. Right, yeah. uh -huh. um, and uh, so when I, the first I did with this guy, I said, I went to Citrus, which was like QB3, but different. And I said, Citrus. Look at what so that was with state funding. Yes, both QB three and Citrus were state funding yes. associated with universities. They're more for more deep tech, right? And and well, QB three is biotech. Biotech. And Citrus yeah. was more information technology. You know, there are. I think I can go to the website. And you, yeah. um, but I said, you know, uh, why don't we use the Skydeck to do something like QB three did at UCSF over here at Berkeley? It was too early for they, people to again. The idea of of a of a, of a startup accelerator, a universe startup accelerator, was still a new idea. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't really get it yet. I mean, mm -hmm. now they're ubiquitous. Now it's like if you don't have one, you're, it's like, it's like you don't have a football stadium or a student union, you've got to have a study. Anyway, so the point is, um, but then eventually Citrus got the, so they created the Citrus Foundry. So this is interesting. This is how I think in many ways why at Berkeley there's kind of a, this goes back to your initial question, mm -hmm. it's a very decentralized, things grew organically here. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you study the MIT ecosystem, it's also some people call it a cacophony of, of, of activity mm -hmm. and also uh, you know to do this activity in information technology versus life science sometimes it's different resources and different things and so maybe that's another reason why it, you know they don't have to be all coming from the same same area but that's why so Berkeley's um, innovation entrepreneurship you know, so it grew more organically and that's why it's more decentralized although we're now making a lot of progress like MIT is of kind of bringing making it more cohesive mm -hmm. For example, we have things, this thing called begin.berkeley.edu, which is our um, portal now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, this has morphed into yeah. something that's much more explainable. Mm -hmm. This is a tool that I use mm -hmm. as a, just yeah. a presentation. I don't yeah. know if you follow mm -hmm. it, like mm -hmm. I did to show yeah. people how you yeah. move through yeah, yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I don't know uh, uh, where you want to go from here, but... Um, no, uh, well, uh, I would like to know, what um, among these boxes here, what were essential to, to, uh, essential to Create considering that it's all emerging and, and there's a lot of overlapping and everything. If you said, well, if only five of these box had happened, they would already have uh, helped us take us to eighty percent of where we are now or whatever. You know, what what are the boxes that are really really important in the ecosystem? Understanding that an ecosystem is is de depends on everyone, right? But yeah, right. if you if you said, oh, if if I had to start over and uh, and I already I, I could pick five boxes of those that. Are, are essential. Which ones are the ones that you would? Well, it's clearly this this um, row here, um, and there. The, the okay. Yeah. The, the, so what, the I guess lot. one of the things interesting that happened is Skydeck was formed, and then uh, you had the foundry. And then you had launching. You know, like all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you had things that were almost competitive to it or overlapping. Mm -hmm. And some of us thought we'd go back to this. Who's the some of us? People that are trying to grow and improve this innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem. Who? Uh, well, like people like me, uh, the vice chancellor of research, mm -hmm. uh, Randy, uh, uh, Randy, it's Randy Cass now, but it was different. Oh, okay. Skydeck people, okay. when I was uh, in Skydeck, mm -hmm. people were long gone, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, so people think that this, this is, and in some ways it's vast and dynamic, mm -hmm. and that's great, mm -hmm. but other people see it as, wow, it's confusing, especially mm -hmm. for people who are trying to get into it, or, and so um, uh, now there's, there's, there's a lot more consolidated, now nice. there's a lot more, um, after kind of that expansion, now people are coming back, mm -hmm. and you know, Skydex taking a certain sector, and Foundry's going to be early stage, and, mm -hmm. and the house they're finding how niches, yeah, right? Right. How is it being divided by uh, area of uh, like biotech or IT, in or some cases by stages? More maturity stages, yeah, maturity, like, very, very, like almost like there's incubators for nascent ideas, and there's accelerators for once you've got something out the momentum, and now we're going to really maybe that's it. what I was trying to refer when I was talking about deep tech. Uh, those that were still would still need much longer time, and and, and I see that uh, that's probably what happens at uh, Citrus. That's right, yeah, right. Yeah, that they're still sponsoring research, right? right that right. may lead to a, a yeah. business later. Right, right. I actually wrote a paper on. Um, 
different types of university innovation entrepreneurs ecosystems and how some of them grow organically and how sometimes the best ones are organic. By the way, Stanford, I don't know if it's still there now, but I, when I wrote that paper a few years ago, you go to the Stanford website, you do a search on Stanford startups, they'll tell you right on the front page of the website, our startup ecosystem is very decentralized. I mean, they literally say mm -hmm. it. And that happens to be an attribute of, of the world's top innovation entrepreneurs of university ecosystems. Anyways, but, but a lot of it also, to do it top down, first of all, a lot of this is, is almost in itself entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you two examples. First of all, mm -hmm. Launch, that's the business school's um, kind of, it's, I wouldn't call it accelerator. I mean, they don't have space, but that's what, it started out as a business plan competition, and now no one does business plans. Now it's, it's kind of like a, um, MB, you know, do your first minimum viable product competition. Yes. It's almost, so, so they evolved that. And when and why did the business plan competition disappear? I, I think again because a lot of these programs have to survive in this. It's like a market. It's a free market. Mm -hmm. And if if someone people, else is doing doing it well, no, better they, or more visibly, they, they're realizing that the, the industry is not doing these long business plans anymore, they're doing MVP, they're doing like a pitch deck and, an M and then a minimum viable <laughs> product. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example, they gotta, they gotta evolve with it. I mean, that's the beauty of this kind of um, dynamic, it's not a top-down thing where people are just doing these things totally, totally systematically, it's more like a free market, mm -hmm. it's a mix. Another good example, um, well, uh, is... Um, Seriously, this is central. Yes. Uh -huh. um, there are, there are, I mean, clean tech to market started just as clean tech, but now mm -hmm. it's it's kind of morphed into the water and things like that, mm -hmm. and and uh, all these. There's there's a this is a key program right here, the Baco Fellows that, that focuses on faculty yeah. or entrepreneurial. Yeah. So, you know, I can I can say that each of these things are. So it's so the, you're saying that it's difficult to point. So, uh, looking, right. so let's go by uh, stages. Who was born which, first? Which are you seeing are relatively well filled, uh, and which are still gaps? Yeah, uh, well, see, the one thing I want to emphasize is I just don't think that you, you get to something and that you're there, it's done. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really just constantly evolving. And one exa example is um, in the area of early stage investing. So we thought we had a hole here that we didn't have, a, in contrast to Stanford and even MIT, we didn't have a lot of early stage investors in and around the campus. So they all had to go down to, to Sand Hill Road mm -hmm. and then they ended up staying there. So now, a few years later, we have Skydeck Fund, mm -hmm. Berkeley Catalyst Fund, mm -hmm. Blue Bear Ventures, um, the House Fund, uh, all, all these, now this whole category filled out, it wasn't there. And these, and these came from where? The, uh, well, um, I guess the first one, the House Fund, that, that was students that graduated and, and saw that there's a need for early stage capital so in, in Berkeley. Young alumni? Yes. And they were organized in some way? Well, the two, two guys got together and just, you know, they were, it, again, it's, it's like an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, each one of these has different stories. Uh, Bear, Blue Bear Ventures came out of uh, um, Foundry, Skydeck came out of Skydeck, Funk came out of Skydeck. And then, by the way, some of these, like this Berkeley Callis one, you mentioned college chemistry. Yes. So um, college chemistry is like thinking, you know, we have to stay competitive. Uh, we need a lot of money to stay competitive, you know, rebuild our facilities. Um, we have all this uh, technology. Why aren't we getting more money from it? And so these, they started this thing called the Berkeley Catalyst Fund. It's kind of an innovative model in that half the carry, half the profits go back to the university mm -hmm. and, and the college of chemistry. So, you know, again, this is like kind of people and, and this away. one, the two alumni, where did they come from? What was their previous experience? Well, one of them came from College of Engineering, and um, he started this thing called Dorm Room Fund. Or, or, or um, There's a Dorm Room Fund, and there's something called Free Ventures. Again, these are like undergrad students creating, these are little funds. Free Ventures is like, gives you like $10,000, mm -hmm. know, maybe, and, and Dorm Room Fund, but that was their experience. And they were doing this from projects, they were doing this undergraduates. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, on their own, just with fellow students, or yeah. is student government active in this here? Not really, no. no. Okay. No. Uh, and, um, but there again, so now when the house started, it's like, how does the house relate to Skydeck? And so there was a little bit of awkwardness there, and so again, they, they worked things out in this, in this kind of... how do these things get worked out? They get worked out because eventually, it, they don't want to clash, they, they want to find their space, and they, they want, everyone wants to 
courses. And by the way, now now some people think I was just at this meeting prior to you guys. I was meeting with um, Creative VC, and they're also a local venture capital firm now, all spun out of Ber Berkeley people. And you know, they see this now as a network of people to syndicate with. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's competition, there's syndication, and and so you know when I see this, it's like part of this is the free market. Uh, um, and it, it's beauty. It's beauty. the dynamics of so it. So when there's conflict, how does it get resolved? Who do they do they come to someone for advice? No, see, we don't have a top-down uh, okay. approach. There's no go guru. No. no. And by the way, one of my examples. Of, so just out of just this past year, out of nowhere, I get an email from these business school students mm -hmm. saying we're creating this program um, to introduce the uh, uh, kids to entrepreneurship. And I, I just said to myself, Well, are you familiar with these other programs? And they said, yeah, but we're going to do some side. Like, differently. The key thing is that they, don't have, they didn't ask anyone for permission. No one could give them permission. They asked you advice. For, they, asked they asked you me to advice. present. They, they asked me to present for this at, at the opening class. Mm -hmm. And that's how they came. That's how mm -hmm. I learned about it. Mm -hmm. But they're not saying, can we have permission to do this? Mm -hmm. But are, are you viewed, uh, fair to say, as a sort of point of uh, uh, knowledge and expertise that people come to you? Informally, yeah. But, uh, and that's are just, there other people like you, or are you the person that people would come well, to? The business school um, has their uh, entrepreneurship that, 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 that doesn't seem to be the, necessarily the role of, uh, of the o o OTL uh, office, but it seems that everyone keeps that, well, you know, the, they, they refer to you. So right, <laughs> this right. is the impression so, that we have in many of the interviews that we've had. So that's why I say so, informally. So you're, you're probably another box around here, you know, besides this, there's another box that so, is but you're, Mike. You're an advisor and promoter of this, not a blockage as it stands. Not a what? Blockage. Oh, yeah. in fact, that's the last thing I want to do is discourage. You know, which is sometimes, you know, you want to give people advice, good advice. I, I, I always like to talk frankly, whether it's a startup idea or just like another part of this ecosystem. But then again, you know, I can't discourage enthusiasm, you know, mm -hmm. especially from young yeah. people. Everything. But but just back to your question. So um, each of the academic programs, they have a director. So the director of the mm -hmm. Berkeley Haas, mm -hmm. she is a key person. Um, there is, is this the Leicester, person, Leicester Center key, still, or key person that in, in re renamed again? Uh, okay. Part of the dynasticism, okay. they, they reposition, right. renamed. Uh, okay. okay, but so uh, they're key in what? What do they? They uh, what? Well, a lot of people. They work with a lot of startups, a lot of entrepreneurs, just because they are the business school's entrepreneurship program. Okay. This one in the College of Engineering, yeah. that guy also, the director of that, is a key person. Yeah. And they're each ICLA, uh, ICLA yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And so, um, but they're operating individually. Yes. Does they, they know they, each other informally? Oh, for, for an outsider, and, and, and this two seem to do exactly the same thing to me. <laughs> but it, right. But yeah. But from an outsider, the, if if I asked any of them, they would say no. There's all the differences. But yeah, because when you dig down, they're yeah. optimized for their program. And you see, here's the thing. Another thing. So faculty, as you know, are very um, independent. Okay. Yeah. Departments all want to be the best department. Colleges want to be the, and so they have a lot of autonomy to be the best in their class. And so, this program is optimized for the College of Engineering. Even though it brings yeah. it also, this program about, makes the business school the yeah. best business school. So that's why there's this, maybe this autonomy yeah. is a natural part of a great university. Um, okay, yes, uh, but then uh, the Stanford model is you have crosswise integrating. That's been the role of design. Yeah, again, it goes across the entire university. The design school. Yes. Yeah, again, again, I don't think anyone said top down the design school. That just became kind it, of a. That's uh, right. It grew up, but uh, yeah. it spreads across. Yeah. Do you have any things like that here at Berkeley that spread across that way? Well, uh, the OTL is very horizontal. Uh, you know, so it was. You spread, guys. Yeah. Yes. Right. You deal with anything dealing with IP, yeah, right. the original model across the whole universe. Right, right. Okay. And so, uh, just, I mean, this story I could, I could talk for hours about, but two years ago, the state. Gave uh, each campus uh, about two point seven million dollars to do to create more uh, uh, I and E infrastructure, and through that each campus had to put together a proposal, and that proposal brought all these together. So for two years we met weekly or monthly, mm -hmm. and we created things like begin.berkeley.edu now that one site. Mm -hmm. so okay, so initiative from the state. Where did that come from in the state? Um, the government, education, from Secretary of Education, or something like that, or. It was just from the uh, from the from the university from, from, from the state of California. State of California. State of California. State of California. It was called AB two six six four. It was a uh, it was a just a, a budget item AB two six six four. Okay. Managed by the UCLP uh, uh, UC Office of the President to uh, in each of the campuses got two points. Okay, so it was managed within the university, but it was a special subvention from the state government yes. in addition to the regular university budget. Right. And it, and it was the governor's idea or. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Are you okay? Uh, sorry for yeah. the. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. no, yeah we're finishing. Yeah. All right. We're probably so over it.
Okay, the governor's idea or? A... Uh, no, it, it was um, actually, uh, it's unclear whose idea it was, but I could tell you that, um, for example, QB3 and this guy who ran QB3, Reg Kelly, was, you know, it was basically, we, we thought, it's, it's unclear how it catalyzed, but there were people that were big advocates for it. And, and so that's how it came okay. together. Anyways, that, that helped I make mean, this here, cohesive. It brought everyone together. Well, it made us all, like you, you asked him to do, of course people know each other, but mm -hmm. now it brought us together because we had money yes. to organize the things. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. to, to be more cohesive. That was a big part of our proposal, to take this and be more cohesive. Mm -hmm. So how did the proposal come up together? We just wrote it mm -hmm. and everything. And So know, who, can, who took the lead in this? Uh, our office and uh, this office here, and you know, we just started writing. Can we have access to this kind of documentation? Or yeah, it's all public. Is it in the website? And it's just not, not that proposal. Oh, no. May I just send you an email? Sure. Here? Uh, and uh, you know, I would just give you, I'm sorry to cut this short, yeah, but I'll show you one, one who thought this is not over by any means. I'll just give you two, yeah, yeah. two examples. Right. One is um, what, one of the things that we learned um, from that AB 2664 is. is we could use a lot more I and E infrastructure. Yes, and that um, the campus has a lot, but um, we can't allow we couldn't allow startups to use that infrastructure <laughs> until if you go to uh, I can send you a link to this program called the Shared Special User Facility for Innovation Entrepreneurship. It's called the SUPI program. Mm -hmm. It allows startups to use faculty labs for commercial R and D, which is kind of radical. It and existed at MIT in the 1940s and 50s oh, informally. Informally, yes. it was inform By the way, so one of the great things about this program is we, we started, we, we basically daylighted a lot of this stuff and made it legal. Yeah. And uh, MIT it was made illegal. Yeah, well, because it is illegal. <laughs> yes. I mean, to use uh, nonprofit research uh, facilities for, for, but we made it illegal. You know, all the COIs that we do, we did like seven things to make it legal. Took it. Uh, it was this is the Sophie, to, Sophie, yeah, yeah, Sophie yeah, thing, yeah, right. right? It was even harder to do than Skydeck. I'm sure. And, and then just I, one, one more quick example. I'd love to know those seven stages or seven things. But yeah, uh, it's on the website. Yeah, if you okay, go to yeah, Sophie okay. again, um, great. The seminar there. It's, it's here, right? It's yeah, that's yeah, it, right. Sophie. Yeah. And then the mm -hmm. most recent thing I was just just approved last week is. Um, just, um, is this thing uh, we're calling uh, um, the Open Source Software Good Standing Program. Berkeley has a huge amount of startups that, uh, that Berkeley developed a lot of software that it then open source, and then startups spin on up front to leverage that. And there's no license there because it's open source. And these mm -hmm. companies have became billion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. Most, yeah. re most uh, recent um, example is Databricks. Mm -hmm. Big data set. Yeah, well, you mentioned it somewhere yeah. here. Data. And so um, and then up, then up, yeah. we're now created this program to, to get um, a little equity from those companies and, and participation rights in this in the subsequent. Voluntarily. Well, not voluntarily. We're going to, in return, we're, we're, over the years they've, they've come to us and say, can you give us a letter saying that we're legal? And we've always said, you know what, um, I'm not quite sure we're going to do that. We are. So now we're going to give them this thing that you're in good standing. In return for this good standing agreement, you're going to give us a small part of equity and participation rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, their lawyers told them that there was something they better clean up? Well, because what the lawyers want to do is they want to de-risk the IP. <laughs> and so they, this helps them de-risk the IP. Yes. Thank you very great. much. It was, thanks. Well, I, I'm looking yeah. forward to yeah. collaborating yeah. on yeah. your research. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. look forward to keeping in touch. Mm -hmm. And, and we have to tell you, you probably already know this, but you know, you, you, there, there's another box here that is Mike. You know, the informal, the, this inf it, it's not the OTL. It's well, because everyone refers to you. Know when go it's talk it's to this guy. The truth is, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge team effort. Yeah, and, um, and so that's a good. Again, if we had more time, I'd talk yeah. about uh -huh. you know each uh, people. T I mean, I t like sorry, Skydeck wasn't me. It was me with yeah. the College of Engineering Dean and Tease. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So I couldn't have done without I'd like to follow up on that. It's yeah. so another, another point, maybe in some of the time. They're all talking. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll be on that on Skype. Next, <laughs> because if so, when you heading back? No, it, it, in uh, in twenty days or so. Oh wow! Okay, well, okay. Yeah. think yeah. We're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're just okay. going in. Right, take your time. Yeah. So, uh, and so, uh, you go in twenty days. You're heading out for the back to Brazil. But you know, I have. Uh, we'll, we'll keep doing these things, and we'll uh, and we'll, we'll still you'll still hear from me also because I'll be sending you emails asking for documents that if 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 there is anything that you can have. Right. Thank you very much Good. for having us. Uh, Thank you. This happen. Anyway. Oh, hi. Yeah. This is, I have to. How you been? I have been. Nice. I went to two laps. Nice to meet you, Professor. Hi. Yeah, I'll have to. She's, she's the girl that I was uh, talking about that is working with your research. There's two labs here. 
Well, it's amazing if I can follow an email to you. Last week could be my last week. Oh, wow. If you have a tweet, 30 minutes of meeting with me, I really appreciate Now? No. Uh, no, in another day. Okay, day. yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, this yeah, afternoon, because um, actually. Um, no, not this afternoon. Tomorrow, yeah, okay. tomorrow, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, just follow up with an email. Thank you so much. He, he has another day. meeting right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hey, it's hi. a pleasure to meet you. Good to meet you too. So, so this is Carla. I'm a fan of your theory oh, of triple okay. helix. Thank it's you. Helping a lot and she, she's going research. to have lunch with us. In, in fact, okay. can, can you give us a ride sure. to my place? Oh, sure. Yeah. sure.